Is strength training and weightlifting actually bad for flexibility and mobility? No, actually not necessarily. You can actually use it to prevent declines in flexibility and mobility and actually somewhat improve it. And the key though is to try to perform an exercise through its absolute full range of motion, or I should say through your absolute full range of motions. Because if you push past those limits, then you're going to cause compensation in another joint. That compensation will lead to pain and injury, et cetera, that whole kind of vicious cycle. So yeah, I always prompt people, whether they're bodybuilders, power lifters, Olympic lifters, working out in general, don't really have goals, just want health and lifestyle benefits. Most of the time, you should be performing all exercises, all lifts through a full range of motion for you. Dr. Wickham, talk to me about the differences between flexibility and mobility and what the average person or average listener out there has mixed up when they're looking at these two things integrating into their fitness plan. Yeah, great question. So there's a lot of confusion around what is flexibility, what is mobility, and there's definitely differences, but there's nuances, right? So if we think about flexibility, think about this is passive. There's no active muscle contraction and essentially what you're going to do, I'll, I'll kind of paint a picture with an example. So if I was going to test your flexibility of say your hamstrings, I would have you lying down on the ground and I would say, I want you to relax as much as possible. Don't contract any muscles. I'm actually going to grab your leg and bring it upward, you know, close to your chest, uh, in that classic hamstring flexibility test. And you're not doing any muscle contraction. You're not, you're not doing anything. So that's, that's flexibility. We're, we're seeing how long, uh, your tissues, in this case, your your muscles, your fascia, your tendons can elongate or stretch. And so active uh, mobility has an active component to it. So it's it's similar. We're still testing, you know, how far you can move a joint, how far you can move your muscles, uh, tendons, fascia, et cetera. But in this case, you're going to be contracting your muscles to do so. And so in that same scenario, you'd be lying on the ground. This time, I wouldn't actually physically move your leg for you. I would actually instruct you to contract your hip flexor muscles to bring your leg up. And that's basically you know, I'm testing to see what your active mobility is, how much you can actually use your own muscles to move your hip joint. And so that's, that's really the big difference between flexibility and mobility is that active component to it and the, the muscle contraction. And it's, it's really what separates, you know, even static stretching from passive, I'm sorry, passive stretching, or AKA static stretching from active stretching. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good visual. I think you kind of gave the entire audience. I'm sure everybody has either seen that or had that done. I mean, it's, you know, you walk into any, you know, box gym these days, you'll see, you know, half a dozen trainers with their clients either laying on a bench or laying on the floor, walking them through that exact stretch. Now they're always doing it from the flexibility side of things where it's the trainer is kind of assisting them. Um, I guess the question kind of comes in my mind. Okay. If we're testing with both of these things, um, how similar is, is the range of motion? I mean, should we be able to, I guess, actively through mobility, get our leg close to where we can get it with the assistance of somebody pushing it? Yeah, you should. Um, you see differences though. So like if, you know, in that scenario where you were testing someone's flexibility versus their, versus their mobility, um, you might get further passively again, testing their flexibility versus their active range of motion. And that tells me that, a, you have the flexibility in your actual tissues, right? They can along, um, they can stretch out passively, but then when you try to fire those muscles using your brain and your nervous system, and obviously the muscles that are creating that movement, there's some disconnect there. And we see that far too often. And really, you know, a lot of, a lot of people get wrapped around like, I want to improve my flexibility. Um, and so I'm going to, again, a lot of people are static stretching. We'll, we'll kind of dive into that, but, you know, improving flexibility is, is really not enough, you know, and it's, it's actually, it can do you harm. There's a thing called being hyper mobile. Um, and that's when you're just super flexible, right? You can put your, your joints into these weird positions. Maybe you can even do a splits kind of naturally. Um, but you don't have the control of the muscles around the joint, AKA you don't have proper or optimal joint stability. And so if you're super flexible, but you don't have that, that active mobility and that active stability, your joints are essentially sloppy, right? And they can kind of, um, you can't control them. And so an example of that would be, say you have really good hip flexibility. Again, say you can do the splits, you know, just naturally, whatever, uh, some people can do it. 
um, without even trying. But you don't have, again, that good active control of your hip muscles, all the hip muscles, the front, the hip flexors, the gluteus medius on the side, the glute max on the back, the inside adductor muscles, really a 360 degree around your hip. You don't have good control. And then say you go for a run, you're just even walking, you're playing a sport or really doing anything in life that involves movement. Um, you're not able to control your hip enough. Well, what happens is that hip's kind of sloppy, right? And then all of a sudden, it, it, it puts your knee in a compensated position. So your knee compensates then for your, your sloppy hip. And I'm just using sloppy as kind of a, you know, a generic term. Um, and so uh, over time, that knee is basically just kind of twisting and it's, it's compensating for the lack of stability at your hip. And that's a huge contributor to knee pain, just using this specific example, because your, your knee's constantly um, being put in positions and it's that those, those compensations then lead to a joint wear and tear. And that joint wear and tear then eventually does typically lead to pain and injury due to joint breakdown. Yeah. And I know this is, this is going to be challenging to do, but sticking with this example here, you know, you're assessing it. We can see that if we, you know, if we have the assistance here, we can push it from the flex flexibility. We've got really good flexibility, but then when we go with the mobility, we're trying to do it uh, actively ourselves. It's kind of limited. You said you were able to kind of diagnose a couple of issues kind of in there. And I know it's going to be hard because this is going to be so specific to the individual that you probably want your hands on this person, but what would be some of the corrections there that if a listener or, or the audience right now is because everybody's going to do this, right? Everybody's going to going to hear this and they're literally going to stop it right now, lay down on the floor, be like, honey, come push my leg back. And then they're going to see it. So if somebody has kind of diagnosed that in, in and of themselves outside of getting in the movement ball, what are some things that they're either looking for or what are some things to correct that? So the mo mobility and flexibility are close within the same. Yeah. So in the, in the case, it's, it's usually if, if there's a difference, you know, and obviously you're never going to probably be exact, but I'm saying like, you know, if you can flex your hip up in this case to 90 degrees um, actively and then, or we'll say passively, we get you up to 90 degrees, but then all of a sudden you try to do it actively, you're only getting to like 60 degrees. Well, that's a huge difference. Then we definitely know there's some, some active mobility deficits there. Um, it's usually not the other way around. It's usually not, you have a ton, actually it's almost, it's never that way. Uh, like to be frank, because to have good active mobility you actually need flexibility as a prerequisite. Got it. So you can almost think of, even going back to that, I'll dive more into it, what they can do, but so you can think of flexibility as again, passive. You're not moving any, activating any muscles. Um, uh, mobility, again, that active component, you can think of flexibility plus active muscle activation equals mobility. Um, so it's kind of like, Again, you need flexibility as a prerequisite. So in that case that somebody does have a lot of flexibility, but doesn't have good mobility, again, they don't have the ability to, to move their joint actively, you just need to really start diving into active stretching and muscle activation exercises because you can, you can you know, static stretch and work on your quote unquote flexibility for hours every day. And it's literally not gonna improve your active mobility at all. And when you think of movement, whether it's in the gym, in a sport, our day-to-day -day life, like we're not doing anything passively, right? So flexibility really doesn't matter if you're just, unless you're trying to be like a, you know, a contortionist or, you know, trying to be cool on uh, Instagram, doing some crazy like positions. Um, you need active movement. You need the ability to contract your muscles, to move your joints. So static stretching to improve that, it's not going to work, you know? So um, yeah, the, the, basically the message is active stretching. Yeah. So even though flexibility is a precursor to mobility, if you're struggling with flexibility, the pathway to fixing that is not passive stretching. It is the active side of things. Did I hear that correct? 100%. Yeah. And I think even diving in to like, what's the difference of static stretching and, and active stretch, stretching? Yeah, let's explore that. This is a great, great, great segue here. Yeah. So uh, static stretching, aka passive stretching. So we use those terms, you know, kind of interchangeably. That's unfortunately the same type of stretches that most people are doing if they are stretching. And that's, that's where we're stretching out again, a muscle or a joint for the people that are viewing this. I'm bringing my arm across my chest and kind of hugging it in, doing that classic shoulder deltoid stretch. And once I do this, I'm just relaxing. I'm not contracting any muscles. Another example, again, if you're sitting down on the ground or even standing up, your knees straight, you go down, down to touch your toes. That would be a static passive stretch. You're not contracting any muscles. You're just passively hanging out. Can I ask you a question here though? If 
in that example that we're doing here, right? So for, for the audio side here is we're, we're grabbing the back of our arm here. We're pulling our, you know, our upper arm, our humerus across our chest. We're really focused on stretching. Like you said, the rear delt, kind of some of that upper back musculature. There's probably going to be some, some trap involved in there as well. Could I make it um, active by contracting my chest? Would that make it more of an active type of movement if I get the pec involved into it? Yeah, so that's a great question. So yeah, the and then kind of coming back to that question, yeah, to turn any stretch or you know the stretches that we use into an active stretch, yep, it it takes some type of muscle contraction. So to get like super specific, we have agonist and antagonist muscles. That just means like okay, so in this case, I'm stretching out. Yeah, like you said, the rear the rear uh, shoulder, the rear delt, maybe some rotator cuff. And so if I want to activate these muscles while they're stretched out, I'm actually going to uh, push my stretched out arm into my other arm that's holding it back. So now I'm doing what's called an isometric contraction. So it's the, the joints maximally stretched out, and then I'm contracting that muscle against, you know, maybe it's a, a hand, maybe it's against a wall, maybe it's against the ground, and I'm contracting the same muscle that, that I'm actually stretching out. And we will hold that for anywhere from 10 to 20 seconds at different intensities. So you can start off with say like a 50% uh, muscle contraction intensity. And as we move up with reps, we can go full on as hard as we can um, contraction. And then to kind of like add more benefit, like you said, you know, when we're stretched out there, then we can contract the other side of the joint. Now in this example, in this, in this classic shoulder stretch here, um, what you would do is you, again, yeah, you'd contract your pec muscle, right? But the pec is now in a shortened position. So we're contracting the pec in a shortened position. That's going to further stretch out a little bit more of the backside of that shoulder. But more so what we're doing there is we're, again, improving the strength, the activation, all of those things in the pectoralis muscles in a shortened position. And if we look at um, muscles in general, right, we've got a, we've got two positions of every joint that are in a lengthened position. I'm getting a little technical, but I'll break it down so it's easy to digest. Yeah, I'm right with you though. Yeah, so we've got two positions of a lengthened position and in the middle, that's that's kind of like a shortened position if we want to take three different um, points there. The elbow is a really good way to visualize this, like a bicep curl, right? Like you're bending your elbow. So when I'm starting with the weight, say, we'll, we'll say it's a barbell in this case. In this case. So when my, my elbows are straight, my, my joint's in a lengthened position. And then when I curl that weight all the way up, so my fists, you know, my palms are close to my shoulders, I've got maximum elbow bending. Now my, my joint is in a shortened position. I think I said that wrong before. There's a lengthened position, a shortened position, and then in between. Um, so we've got the lengthened position with the elbow straight. We've got a maximally shortened position with the elbows bent. And in between is kind of obviously just in between. And if we look at research, you're going to be strongest when you're in the mid range of motion. So in this case with a, a bicep curl, when your elbows are about 90 degree angle, you're going to be the strongest there. You're going to be the weakest in your shortened position. Again, with your elbows maximally bent, you're also going to be the weakest when your elbows are maximally straightened. And that goes the same for every joint, your shoulder, your hips, just like another example would be a squat. When people are squatting a barbell, you know, you're, you're never usually failing at the top, right? You're always failing when you're in the hole and your lowest point because for that movement, your hips, you know, there's there's certain muscles that are in a lengthened position, there's certain muscles that are in a shortened position, and you know, you're gonna fail backwards. So the beauty, I, I'm going back to our, our stretch here, the shoulder, the beauty of strengthening the a muscle in its shortened position is you're actually improving the strength, the stability, the muscle activation in that muscle in the shortened position. And are you ever gonna get your you know, shortened position as strong as your mid range. No, you won't just because that's just how physiology works. But most pain and injuries uh, happen when they're e the joints either shortened or lengthened. And so if we can get more stability there, get stronger there, not only is that going to improve mobility, flexibility, range of motion, but you're also going to be, you know, able to perform lifts and movements better, but you're also going to decrease pain and injury risk. Yeah. Uh, I love this, man. Like this is, this is, I spent a decade here in, in, in this space, understanding mechanics, looking at some of these principles around hypertrophy based training. Right. So I've got a background in bodybuilding. I've worked with a lot of incredible coaches out there. So I'm, I'm right in line with everything we're talking about. And, it, and it, it rises the question up. I think that the audience would probably get a lot of value out is I guess, as we're talking about mobility, what role does strength training 
playing it, like, like building muscle. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with something with you, man. Like when I was coming up in my twenties, like I thought that tight muscles were going to be bigger muscles. Like, so I avoided any type of strength. Like I almost wanted to be as tight as possible. I think I saw all these bodybuilders that were just kind of muscle bound. It was like, they had very limited mood. I was like, well, if I'm going to be as big as those guys, that's what I need as I need these tight, tight muscles. Um, so what, yeah, I guess what role does this proper strength training play in understanding this entire strength curve of, of a movement play in proper mobility and or flexibility? Yeah, that's a great question. And like you, you know, I never was like super jacked up, but yeah, I, I kind of came, I've always been like interested in different like training methodologies. And, you know, my dad got me the, uh, Arnold's, um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger encyclopedia of bodybuilding, you know, when I was like in third grade, he was in the army and he, he always worked out. So I'm flipping through those things. Like, I'm sure it's right, now want... you go back to some of that stuff and you're like, God, this was just some of the most worst, horrible advice ever. But it, I mean, he I was, mean, he yeah. Was I mean, if, if, if your goal is, yeah, yeah, for sure. There's definitely better, you know, research and stuff, but, uh, it's, it's pretty solid though. I mean, that, that big old thick book, you know, it's like, all right, I'm going to do this to increase the density of my, uh, my triceps versus, you know, increase the peak head of my bicep. Um, but um, yeah, and there is that kind of notion that like, say you have a, a heavy leg day, right? You're, you just spent that day doing deadlift squats, whatever you're doing, you, you tore up that muscle and that connective tissue back there, right? You got some soreness. Well, we don't want to stretch it out because we don't want to delay, you know, the, the, um, the repair of those muscles. I mean, that's, that's kind of the thinking that I've heard quite often, um, which isn't quite the case. And to going back to the question of strength training, flexibility, and mobility. Um, yeah, if you're if you're just training in mid ranges of motion, often. So say you're doing you're doing a bench press, right? A lot of people obviously are familiar with bench pressing. Um, if you're just doing a, a, a partial range of motion, so you're not locking out your elbows every time, right? You're not going full top, and you're not letting that bar come close to your chest. If you have the adequate shoulder mobility, actually letting that bar come to your chest, that would be a full range of motion. Now, if you say just um, you're not quite locking out your elbows, maybe you're you're going a few inches less than elbow locking, and you're only going down, say three or four inches, right? You'll see different training uh, principles, methodologies, specifically hitting that mid range. And there are, you know, benefits to that for sure. Um, but if that's the way you're training all the time, your body adapts and conforms to the positions and the movements that you perform most often, just like sitting in a desk for, you know, eight hours a day times X amount of decades, your body will literally come become that hunched over position, you know, forward neck, you've got a rounded back, you know, your, your, your core is just super weak and you have issues because you you're always using your backrest. Same principle. If you're just doing mid range of motion all the time, well then, yeah, that will actually contribute to tight muscles and tight joints. So, you know, is, is strength training and weightlifting actually bad for flexibility and mobility? No, actually not necessarily. You can actually use it to um, prevent uh, some, you know, declines in flexibility and mobility and actually somewhat improve it. And the key though is to try to uh, perform an exercise through its absolute full range of motion, or I should say through your absolute full range of motion. So, you know, your, your shoulder mobility will differ be different than my shoulder mobility, which then dictates how much I can do a shoulder movement in versus, you know, the next person. Because if you push past those limits, then again, just like the knee example before, you're going to cause compensation in another joint. That compensation will lead to pain and injury, et cetera, that whole kind of vicious cycle. So yeah, I always prompt people to, whether they're bodybuilders, power lifters, Olympic lifters, just, you know, kind of working out in general, don't really have goals, just want health and health and lifestyle benefits. Um, most of the time, at least 80% of the time, um, unless you have specific goals, you should be performing all exercises, all lifts through a full range of motion for you. And yeah, you're not going to get tight for being, I mean, you, you, some of the old, uh, bodybuilders, um, I'm drawing a blank right now, but, uh, Platts, I think was his name, right? Um, it's kind of old school dude. He, I mean, some of these guys had, um, ridiculous flexibility. That's because they, a trained it. Did they have some kind of genetics going on? Yeah, probably as well. But yeah, if they're on the if they're on the Olympia stage, man, they're 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 a top point zero one percent, you know, genetics, you know, in 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 the world. I think even guys like Kai Green, who's more recent, uh, you know, to to the, to the modern uh, listener here, you know, he's been on the Olympia stage doing full splits. Um, so the answer is yes. Like if you are uh, struggling with mobility, um, in addition to 
the stretching, the active stretching you need to be doing, you need to be in, 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 in some type of strength training. And I would say the more advanced you get into your training, I hope you agree with this. It's not going to be one exercise is going to train the muscle through its entire range. You're probably going to need a collection of two, three, maybe exercises to fully train that muscle in every possible position. Correct? Oh yeah. hundred percent. I mean, it's again, your body adapting to, and the more, the more variation you can put as far as ranges of motion, you know, just even the slightest bit of angle uh, tweaking, if you will, for a for a, a joint. Because at the end of the day, you're just you're, you're training joints. You know, it, it seems kind of interesting to sound like that. Like, okay, I'm, I'm training quads, right? Okay, well, what is quads? You're actually kind of like you're training the knee joint, really, because most of your quads just control your knee. Um, obviously, you have a, a rectus femoris, but yeah, hundred percent variation is is key. Yeah. This is, is this a newer way of, of thinking? I feel like, or maybe it's, maybe it's, there's different schools of thought out there. I, 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 I've heard different people say, you know, and I, I subscribe more to your belief system that the muscles move the joints. But I think if you're going to get maybe more of a chiropractic realm, it's more the joints are moving the muscles. Like are these different, different schools of thought that, that you've heard? Yeah. So, I mean, I can see where the other side is. I mean, if you, if you really break it down, there's no way to move a joint without a muscle, right? Like, so, um, you know, back in PT school, you know, over a decade ago, uh, we actually dissected cadavers, you know, real live cadavers. And so we, we parsed it out. We got deep. You can actually see where this muscle is, the rectus femoris or, you know, the serratus anterior. And, you know, you get really nitty gritty in that. And, you can also see the joint itself. So technically, again, this is kind of semantics, you know, but the joint for the most part, we think about two bones, right? Two bones. And then we've got ligaments that uh, surround and connect those two bones, um, as well as some fascia. And then to move actually a joint, you need a muscle to cross that joint. And that muscle has to cross that joint. You know, the tendon obviously crosses it. The tendon inserts into the other bone. And so without the muscle, there's no, there's no movement. I know it. I know what they're saying that say if you have tight ligaments or say you have some, um, it, very rare like predisposition to some joint mechanic issues. Say your 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 joints are are or I should say your bones that make up that joint are shaped a certain way. That is going to dictate how you can move per se, right? So to really have movement of a joint, you need muscle. So you need that. You need that central nervous system, uh, brain, uh, spinal cord, and the nerves that come off the spinal cord to innervate a muscle. Boom, we've got that electrical current per se that can that innervates the, the muscle that causes the contraction that then the muscle shortens because that muscle shortens. Then, you know, when you have a shortening of the, the muscle, then the, the joint moves. Um, so I would say you absolutely have to have the, the muscle central nervous system connection. But yeah, obviously the way the joint shaped um, and the actual ligaments. So you can have a you can have a tight muscle or a tight fascia, but you can also have tight ligaments as well. Um, and there's different approaches to address that um, slightly than to you know say try to improve mobility of a actual muscle or fascia, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe wrapping up stretching here because I want to get to maybe some pain stuff as well, and and I, I want to talk to you about feet. Um, not that I have a I don't have a fetish around it, but I'm really fascinated by, by feet. Um, but I feel like we're kind of shitting on uh, passive stretching here. Uh, in reality, it feels damn good sometimes, like to just stretch some things out, right? Um, so what it, and when is a time where maybe this more passive stretching can be useful and beneficial to us? Yeah, so there's there's definitely a reason why, you know, I'm really, I'm against static or passive stretching for two different reasons, maybe three different reasons. Completely. For the most part. So we'll talk about that. You need to meet some prerequisites. Again, I mean, you're a human, you're a person, you do what you want, right? We all have finite time. Um, you know, some people, most of us, all of us are super busy. So you can do whatever you want, you know what I mean? Like, but do you want to use your time valuable and actually get results? Because if you keep on doing the same thing and expecting different results, obviously everyone knows that's the definition of crazy. So Use your time wisely. Hey, work smarter, not harder, right? All the cliches at one time. Um, so if we look at the research, static stretching has been shown to increase injury risk and decrease performance. So I always repeat that twice. So really it soaks in. Static stretching, again, which most people are doing, has been shown in research to uh, increase injury risk and decrease performance. Is that pre-training or pre-activity? 
Typically pre-training, yeah. That, so, I mean, there's there's a plethora of different studies. You really have to go through decades of work and kind of parse out each study to um, to make a a good global. And I've done that. I've spent you know days and and I'm always continuing to dive into that stuff, um, looking at the whole body of evidence. Right. So we always want to be science based. We always want to be research based. So all the stuff we do in the Movement Vault Stretching app, it's based off science. That's why we don't recommend static stretching. We, we recommend active stretching, but then, okay. So science and research, that's all really good. Um, but we also need to use common sense. So let's say, all right, we've seen the research and the science says this, right? Pre-exercise, pre, pre, um, pre-movement, but also on just injury risks in general. So static stretching on injury risks in general. Um, I don't, I don't want to delve out too much, but we might have a, uh, a study in, underway with the movement fault, uh, uh, methodology versus static stretching. We'll save that because we're we're far from getting it published. Um, we're not actually doing it. This is a, a third party university, one of the top universities in the in in the United States. But um, so if we take a step back, right? Let's let's try to use common sense because we always want to look from a scientific perspective at the research and then the knowledge of the whole subject, and then let's try to connect some dots because sometimes things aren't as straightforward as we like. Like for instance, what causes Parkinson's disease? We still don't know. Um, we know certain things correlate with it. Um, we have to draw, we have to be very, um, we need to know the science, but we also have to connect some dots and people are still doing that. Um, so there's, there's many different things in science that we do like this, but if we take a step back and we're trying to passively do something to get better at something active, that just doesn't make sense. Right? So we're, we're, we're passively stretching, AKA statically stretching, no muscle contraction, no muscle activation nothing active in that whole process, but we're trying to get better at something active. That's, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't pass the BS rate uh, meter to me, right? Like that just doesn't make sense from a common uh, sense perspective. So that's why when you're active stretching, you're going to improve muscle activation. You're going to get stronger in your joints and range of motion. You're going to improve your joint stability. You're going to improve your what's called proprioception, AKA body awareness, which is your ability to, you know, connect and activate with specific muscles. You're going to improve your balance because now your joint's stable. You're not doing any of that with uh, static stretching. And so going back to, should you ever static stretch? My advice to people is again, you do what you want. <laughs> uh, if you want to actually like make progress, uh, most people don't have time to static stretch. You know, my, my, my recommendations is three times a week at the minimum, you should be doing what, what I call joint maintenance, joint maintenance in the form of an effective active stretching routine. It doesn't have to take hours a day, as long as it's, you know, effectively programmed anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, three times a day is what you should be doing to maintain your joints so that you don't have a, you know, joint replacement down the line. You significantly decrease your chances for pain and injury. You're able to move like your joints were supposed to move, whether you're trying to play with your kids, clean your house or work out. Um, so if you at least check that box of I've done three times, you know, throughout the week, then yeah, throwing in, if you got some extra time, like um, never before a workout for sure. Um, never, I mean, it's pretty clear there. So static stretching, yeah, if you want to do it after a workout, just, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, work on some nice breath work to uh, decrease your nervous system, kind of relax a little bit or late night, um, you know, whenever you want to do it just to kind of relax. But know that you, you are not, you know, it's not an effective way to improve your joint mobility, stability, all those things that I just mentioned. And so if that's your goal, your goal and your actions are not aligning. No, that's great, man. Yeah, no, no, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't trying to, you know, challenge or push, you know, push there. But it's like, first off, I think more people probably have more time available or the average person has more time available than what they maybe give themselves credit to if they shut off social media, if they shut off Netflix and they, you know, stopped with maybe some of the toxic things that are better within their life. But as you said, if you have three days a week of active mobility in your work, if you have a good strength training program where you're getting in the gym three, four times a day, if you're following proper nutrition, if you're sleeping well, if all of those boxes are checked, but you know what, like late at night when maybe a game's on or I'm watching a show on Netflix, like it just feels good to kind of stretch some things out, allows me to work on my breathing a little bit. It maybe allows, you know, cause sometimes stretching can be painful. So maybe I'm even testing a little bit of a pain threshold there as well. Then it can be slotted in, but understanding like that isn't going to be the one thing that kind of improves your performance even a half of a percent. It's just, you do it because you enjoy it. And I, I'm sure that would probably be your same thoughts in around like a practice like yoga, right? Like if you enjoy doing yoga and it brings you peace and it brings uh, mindfulness 
into your life. Like understand it's not going to make you a top tier athlete, but if it's a part of your life that you want to have in there, then by all means go out there and do it. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I never try to dissuade, you know, it's just like I said, like it's, it's your choice, what you want to do and just, you know, doing anything, making that step to do anything positive for your body, for your health, for you, I'm all for it, you know? Um, and if jumping into active stretching for whatever reason doesn't resonate with you or, you know, whatever it is, and you're just really stuck on static stretching right now, I'd say, you know, continue it. Um, and you know, when it comes to yoga, yeah, yoga is a little bit tricky there. Cause there's, there's so many different forms and types depending on what kind of, you know, teacher training and methodology, there's some yoga that's pretty amazing. You know, there's, they actually incorporate a lot of active stretching, but then more power-based yoga. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's some that are just really flexibility based again, static stretching. Um, so it, it's kind of a mixed bag there. Um, I think, it, you know, it can, it can have a place, but like you said, if, if it brings you enjoyment and it's checking a lot of boxes for you, um, is it the most optimal thing to, you know, do all those things that we just said, improve, uh, you know, performance, mobility, decrease injury risk? Yeah, probably not depending on the, the form that you're doing, but yeah, you get some joy out of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, no, 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 why you're doing it and how it lines with the bigger, the bigger vision and aim of, of what you're trying to accomplish physically. Um, what about myofascial release? Um, you know, like I know things like foam rolling and, and, and these different practices are, I mean, they're a massive, uh, wave, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm not a huge proponent or subscriber of, of a lot of these things. Um, but you see people in the gym all the time, you know, pre-workout, post-workout, mid-workout kind of rolling on these, on these foam rollers. What, if any, uh, effectiveness is that having, is it something that people should avoid doing? How, do, how does that play into this conversation? If at all? Yeah. So myofascial, you know, release muscle release stuff. We're talking about like, like you said, foam rolling using mobility balls. Um, you could even couple in like a, a targeted massage, or if you go to a, a physical therapist or a chiropractor and they do, you know, like a, an active release technique, these are all just forms of what's called manual therapy. And so the question is, A, do they work? And then the second question is, what are they doing? You know, so the first thing is, if all you're doing is foam rolling or some type of manual therapy, like a lacrosse ball on a certain muscle to quote unquote, release a muscle, that can actually be effective to open up a range of motion, but it's going to be a short term window because what we're doing is we're actually not breaking up muscle uh, or, you know, muscle knots or fascia knots. Cause you know, you might roll up on your upper trap and like, oh man, that's a nice knot there. I'm going to, I'm going to break that up with the, the mobility ball. Well, you're not actually uh, what research says at this point, this to what we know, um, what the scientists that have studied it know, um, that you're actually not breaking up the fascia and these muscle, uh, knots per se, because it takes thousands of pounds of force to really break up a muscle tissue, connective tissue. And you literally have to like drive over your quad with your truck um, to do that. Uh, I, I definitely do not recommend. Nobody go out there and test that. There's not a prescription. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, don't, I do not recommend that. Uh, there's speed bumps out there for a reason. Um, so, so is it working? Yeah, it actually does. So like if say, if your rhomboid muscle, that's a, a commonly tight muscle between your, your upper back and your inside of your shoulder blade, it kind of spans in between that area. If you lay on a, a mobility ball and then say you punch your arm up to stretch out that muscle, you do an active release technique for that rhomboid, you're going to automatically probably see some improvement in your range of motion of your shoulder, specifically shoulder flexion, AKA just lifting your arm over your head. So was that effective? Yes, it was effective at opening up that range of motion, but now what is it doing? It's, it's basically having a uh, effect on the central nervous system. So your central nervous system is always trying to protect you um, based on previous injuries, what you're doing in life. Your nervous system remembers everything. Um, we can dive into that if you want, but couple that with your postures throughout the day. You know, are you getting in, you know, rotational movements, all these things that could make a muscle tight due to your central nervous system. So then all of a sudden you, you lay on this, this mobility ball or someone digs in there uh, with their thumbs and then all of a sudden you have that improvement. Well, what happens there is you're sending an input via your muscles through these receptors. It's going back up to your nervous system. Your nervous system then send an, an output back to that muscle. And then all of a sudden it decreases some of that muscular tone. So it, it does work as a long answer. <laughs> it does work opening range of motion, but that window will decrease. And you open the range of motion, but you actually didn't increase your active mobility. You didn't increase your stability. Um, so the, the answer is I, I love muscle and fascia releases techniques, bunch of different ones, as long as you're doing it correctly. But 
keep in mind, you need to always couple that. And what we do in Movement Fault is we'll do, you know, certain classes, we'll do a, a muscle or a fascia release technique, again, with the foam roller, lacrosse ball. And then we'll couple that right after with an active stretch or a muscle activation exercise actively. So yeah, just like you, I see people that just foam roll and that's all they do. And then they go and squat, um, you know, not the, not the best, you know, way to use your time and, or that effective. And yeah, if all you're doing is, is foam rolling again, it's, it's not going to be an effective measure. Yeah, no, that's great, man. I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, let's talk about pain. Cause you know, I, I know this is a, an area of expertise for you and, you know, I don't know what the numbers are. You probably have some data in and around this, the amount of people that have probably the two most common pains are going to be backs and knees. And, you know, one probably being due to sitting, the other maybe being due to um, poor mobility, probably in and around hips and ankles. So what's causing the back pain or knee pain in people? And how does our mobility work prevent it, improve it, and, and, and allow us to, I guess, longevity way, both train and just live a better quality of, of life? I know that's a lot of questions packed into one, but I know you got something here. Yeah, we'll, we'll unpack it. If we look at, um, you know, re really what causes the root cause of most pain, this sounds like a generic answer, but it's so true after, you know, the years and, you know, thousands of people I've worked with, whether that's in person or, you know, in the app or, you know, whether they're a professional athlete, MLB, NFL, or just, you know, quote unquote, the everyday person is it all comes down to joint compensation. And again, it's, it's, caused by tight muscles or tight joints, right? And you mentioned sitting for the low back. That's that's huge. You know, sitting is actually causing a lot of pain in a lot of different places because again, when we're sitting in a typical chair uh, versus like say sitting on the ground with your legs crossed, you know, your hips at a 90 degree angle, um, your knee's going to be bent. So your hamstrings are shortened, your, your hip flexors are shortened. And again, you're not going to turn into, you know, a tight ball of mess overnight or even in a week or even in a month or even in a year. But, you know, we've been sitting at a desk since we were five years old, most of us. And, you know, you, you, then you start to work. And if you actually add up the amount of time where you're actually not either sitting or lying down in a day, even if you work out for an hour a day, um, it's pretty staggering. I have people, that's like an exercise I do with people sometimes, like add up, you know, the amount of time where you're, you're, you're literally not sitting or laying down. And it's, 22, 23 hours sometimes, 21 hours, 20 hours um, is spent just sitting down or lying. And so, and then when you are moving, it's just usually in one movement plane. So you're just going straight forward usually, whether that's walking, whether that's going on a run, whether that's bench pressing, whether that's overhead press, push-ups, squatting, it's all in the same, what we call plane of motion. We call that the sagittal plane, but we're not moving side to side as much through our day-to-day -day activities or getting in rotation and through our day-to-day -day, day -day activities and or our workouts. So again, your body's you know conforming to this, compensating um, for this. And again, that's going to, over time, create tight muscles or in tight joints, which then is gonna lead to uh, this compensation. So at the hips, yeah, you're 100% right. Tight hips are almost always a contributor to low back pain. Um, sitting, huge contributor to low back pain. And so one of the culprits there besides, you know, the, the hip flexors being tight and weak, the hamstrings being tight and weak, uh, that's another point. People think that, oh, my hip, my hip flexors are just tight. Well, a lot of times they're tight actually and weak. That's where active stretching also comes into play. But on top of that, people are using their back rests. And so when you use your back rests, you're essentially taking out all the demands on your midsection core muscles. So the midsection core wraps around your entire spine. We're thinking about the spinal erector muscles. We're thinking about the quadratus lumborum, basically the muscles in the back as well. Sometimes people just think of the, the six pack abs as your, your core. Uh, it's only one, you know, um, and it's really not doing that much. It's more your, your back muscles, your obliques, your internal, external obliques. So they just get to take the time off, right? You're using your backrest. You're using maybe your, your, uh, your little elbow uh, rest on the side and you're just kind of relaxing. You're, you're diving into your work. Everything's shut off. Well, again, over time, your body's going to adapt to that. You're going to get a weak, not only a weak core, but you're also going to lose some of the ability, not to say you, you can't like activate your, your midsection core anymore. That it's just not most likely not possible or else you wouldn't be sitting up and walking around, but you lose optimal activation of that. 
of that midsection core. It could be obliques, could be the deep transverse abdominis, um, the spinal erector muscles. I see it all the time. People, um, you know, when I, when I used to be working more so with people in person all the time, getting them to fire and activate the specific spinal erector muscles and the, all the muscles that attach into the back, really challenging. Um, you know, can we get them there? Of course we can. Um, so yeah, sitting hundred percent contributing to back pain, tight hips due to sitting, contributing to back pain, knee, also tight hips. Also with the knee, it's, um, tight ankles as well. And you mentioned even foot mobility. Um, so if the ankles are tight, but say you even have a mobile hip, stable hip, then to compensate for the ankles, it's usually going to be the knee again. Um, and again, that's going to cause wear and tear pain, that whole cascade that I've been kind of really pounding in here. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, three, three things that have, I don't like to throw this around lightly changed my life, but I really, I truly feel that, man. I just turned 40 less than two months ago. Um, and I've been training, lifting weights for 25 years, lifting them at somewhat of a pretty high level for the last 15. I mean, I had a lot of weight on my back. I've, I've moved significant amounts of weight. I've put on gains, lost the same amount of muscle. I've gone through bodybuilding press. I've gone through bulks where I've been 280. I've been on stage at 240. Um, I feel better now at the age of 40 than I did at 30. Just my ability to move through the gym, my ability to go out and play. Uh, you know, I'm still involved in, in kind of some recreational sports. And I think three contributors of that have been a, a standing desk. I can see you're standing as I'm speaking to you right now. That has been life changing since 2018. When I first got this, it's like, I don't spend my entire time here, but when I have the ability, especially on things like this, it's like, yeah, get up and talk, you know, right? Like why do I need to be sitting down? I feel more energized when I'm up talking to you and even some typing and some working when I'm doing some, some more creative stuff, I'll try to be standing. Um, a second one has been regular walks. I know I told you before we, we jumped on here, I was listening to a conversation that you were having when I was out for, for my daily walk. Like it has been a part of my daily life, getting outside, obviously the, the vitamin D, the sunlight, looking across the planet, I'm a big fan of Huberman and all the things he talks about with the value of, of daily walks and just allowing your eyes to kind of gaze through the horizon. But I think that's helped obviously with just the, the mobility side of things, just that, you know, although it is that sagittal plane that you're talking about, like I'm, I'm getting more movement than the average person. And the third one has been the shoes that I wear. I had uh, Steven Sashin on the show uh, about a year ago, founder of Zero Shoes. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Zero out there, but they're, you know, one of the top three barefoot minimalist style brands uh, in, in the world. And I've been, you know, wearing those type of shoes uh, for almost three years now. Uh, I've worked with a, I guess called a gait specialist. I'm not sure if you're familiar with GOTA training, G-O-A-T-A, greatest of all time athletes. Uh, they really break down your stride. I mean, he literally had me on the ground crawling for a short window of time. And then we got back up to, he literally like restructured my walk pattern. So those three things, like I said, have put me in a position where at 40, squat without knee pain, I get out of bed without any type of lower back pain, no, no knee pain at all. I mean, the guys that I was coming up with 10 years ago, these guys are old men. Like they, they struggle to move. And here I am like dunking basketballs running, you know, across a, a, a softball field last night. So uh, talk about if you can, uh, shoes and, and the importance of the things that we put on our feet, how that could possibly be harming us or, or even limiting some of our movement and mobility. I love, you know, everything that you just said there, you know, walks great. You know, it's, you know, earlier in kind of my training in my life as well. It's like, man, well, walks are kind of a waste of time. Like if I'm going to do something. I might as well do some sprints or like, I might as well at least go for a jog or, um, but yeah, I'm the same way. Big, big fan of walking. Um, just kind of getting, getting in that flow state. You know, it's like humans, we were, you know, we weren't sprinting all the time. We weren't lifting weights all the uh, we time. We weren't sitting all the eight, time. 10 miles. I mean, for, for hundreds of years, like that's how we, that's how we got around. I mean, we weren't, we weren't meant to sit in these little machines and drive us from place to place. It's like, no, we're, I think we're built like the, the human machine is, is, is built to move through, through planes of fields. So yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah. And just the fact that you're, you know, you're at 40 and and everyone's like, oh man, 40 so old, you know, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you in the same camp. I actually turned 40 this year as well. And, um, I got asked recently in an article, they're like, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, adjust and tailor your workouts when you turn 40, you know, which I was very, uh, you know, I love answering that question. Um, it's like, well, actually, if you're checking like at least a decent amount of the boxes in health, fitness, lifestyle going up to that point there's no adjustments at all. Maybe you're actually adjusting to, you know, increase your weight or your volume. Maybe it's the opposite adjustment. Like you said, you're performing better than ever. You know, it's, it's not decreasing it like, oh man, I'm decrepit and my shoulder hurts and my, my low back pain that runs in the family is 
you know, keeping me down. No, it's actually, I feel awesome. I'm 40 years old and I'm peaking right now. And I'm probably going to be peaking for the next decade to two decades. Um, so with that said, that's my plan, bro. That's right, man. You know, it's, uh, these vessels that we have, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to spend eight hours a day just thinking about it and being like super neurotic. But again, if you're using your time wisely, right? Like diet, fitness, water, air, like all these things matter, these little things, Hey man, you're going to be, you're going to be crushing it forties, fifties, sixties. And who knows, man, once science starts to get in this, maybe we'll be uh, crushing it forever, but <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing, but as far as the feet go, yeah, feet, um, very, uh, undervalued. So we say we've got this saying in movement fault, right? Like you come from the bodybuilding, uh, background, you know, I've kind of dipped into that myself. Well, the, the, the saying is like, don't skip leg day, right? Like everyone wants to bench on Monday, you know, chest and tries, but, uh, no, no leg day. And, uh, we have a saying in movement fault, don't skip feet day. Uh, just a little bit of play there. And so, you know, within the app, we, we hit everything from the neck all the way down to the big toe. So any weak link in your kinetic chain is going to cause compensation, right? So if your big toe's tight, if your foot doesn't pronate and supinate correctly, um, you know, if you have quote unquote flat feet and are doomed forever, which is what a lot of people are taught, which totally incorrect. Uh, most people, most people are wearing orthotics uh, sh don't even need them. You know, you just need to work on the mobility, stability of those intrinsic foot muscles. Yeah. Is there a small, uh, genetic predisposition where someone might have to, unfortunately, yes. And just like, you know, can active stretching reduce and prevent all pain and injury? Not all of it. You know, there is that small percentage that does have a pre-genetic disposition, which is very, we're talking small, you know, one, 2%, not what media and what most people think. Um, or, you know, if you have a unfortunate, bad luck, traumatic injury, car accident, et cetera, you know, it's stretch. You're not going to outstretch that unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so motion, when we think about walking, running, that all starts at the big toe. And so if we don't have proper big toe extension and more importantly, active big toe instead extension, not just, you know, again, passive, uh, then that's going to cause compensation all the way up the chain. So if you don't have that, that extension in the big toe, that's going to cause compensation in the, the ankle then it's going to cause compensation in the knee. And a lot of times with people with rigid or just not stable feet, yeah, they will experience knee pain. They might experience uh, shin splints, plantar fasciitis, all these things. And, you know, going to the minimalist shoes, you know, that, that's amazing, right? Like, um, I'm, I'm like you, I've been wearing like a minimalist style shoe for probably about going on 15 years now. Um, and so I'm, I'm always encouraging minimalist shoe wear, uh, with a couple of caveats. So the first thing is, you know, what is your, your foot mobility stability look like? Now, obviously I'm going to tell you to use active stretching and mobility techniques to improve that, uh, foot mobility, that big toe mobility. Cause you know, working with so many patients, I'm actually assessing their big toe in person, right? Like when I did all my work in person, um, and you would be surprised, maybe not that the amount of people that have tight, big toes it's astronomical. Um, and that is in part due to our footwear. Um, so that's, that's always a big problem. Again, kind of cause compensation bunions, even that's another huge thing, uh, more so in the female population, but also, uh, in males as well. But, um, when it comes to minimalist footwear, my question is how much time are you spending barefoot in general? You know, a lot of people are like, man, I go home, I've got my house shoes. I've got my house slippers. I'm like, wait a minute, why are you wearing house slippers? You know, do you have like glass around your house? I can't walk, you know, because I have wood floors and, you know, my feet hurt. I'm like, okay. Um, now I'm not going to give you the, the harsh reality of you're very fragile, unfortunately, which that's the case. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's the case. Just like the same thing when I have a, you know, I'm working with a, a patient and they've got a 500 plus deadlift, right? Really strong individual. Um, and then all of a sudden they go down you know, kind of rotate a little bit to pick up their, their 10 pound child. And all of a sudden, boom, their, their back goes out. And I'm like, my man, you are, you got a really strong deadlift in that sagittal plane. But then when you rotate to the left and you pop 10 pounds is not very heavy. Sorry to break the news, but you're a fragile human. Um, and how do we, obviously all the things that we're talking about right now is going to help you unfragile yourself, if that's even a word. But, um, yeah, when it comes to uh, minimalist footwear, you need to work into it. You know, it actually can cause pain and injury if you do it too fast, and especially depending on your age. Have you been wearing these cushy shoes with very narrow toe boxes um, for a lot of your life? Um, then yeah, you need to work into it 
in a, a systematic way. So that starts with just being barefoot at home. Uh, maybe it's only being barefoot 10 minutes out of the, the day at home, you know, if you really need to work into it. Um, so yeah, huge proponent, minimalist shoes, huge proponent on doing active mobility for the big toe, the feet. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and guys, we'll actually, I'll link uh, the episode with Steven Sashin down in the show notes for you guys. And on the YouTube side of things, we'll have it plugged down there in the description because we walk through how to really work your way into these things, how to go from 10 minutes to an hour to where basically you can go outside and run on pavement 100% barefoot without any pain at all. But that was a really good kind of kind of summary breakdown there. If you guys want to go a layer or two deeper and get a full, you know, kind of 60, 60 plus minute breakdown on, on how to use these shoes, I'll have that link down there in the show notes for all of you. Um, Grayson, this has been amazing, man. I want to, you know, begin to kind of wrap things up here a little bit. Let's, let's get, you know, real uh, tangible here for, for the audience. So, you know, we've given them a lot of knowledge. We've, we've, we've covered a vast array of topics here. If we zero, you know, zoom back into the active stretch side of things, I'd love to give the audience maybe something to walk away with. Obviously we want to point them to the movement vaults, uh, which is, you know, your big project has been working on for a really, really long time. But if we can give the listeners the, you know, the, the, the guys out there, maybe five, active stretches. I know once again, it's going to be hard to do it for everybody because it's going to be so individualized, but what would you say are your top five active stretches that everybody needs to or should be doing? Yeah, it's a great question. And so the first thing is if we, if we really dialed it in, right, you would, we would do a, a mobility assessment on say this individual, like where are your deficits per se? Are your, do you have really tight hips versus some someone might have a little bit more mobile hips. Um, so we can get granular like that. And you could actually, you know, go to a, a skilled physical therapist, um, you know, movement specialist to do a mobility assessment or quick plug here for the movement fault app. Uh, we have a virtual mobility assessment where we'll actually take you through a 14 step test, just like as if you were to come to see me in person. And after you do that 14 step te test, it takes about 10 minutes. Um, you can do it as many times as you want in the app. It'll give you a total mobility score. So it'll actually give you a score that you can use to assess yourself now and then use it to compare uh, your progress as you as you go down the line. And it also gives you an individual score for every major joint. So like your upper back, your shoulders, your hips. So you can really hone out where your deficits are. But with that said, um, you know, everyone's got their kind of like points that they need to work on a little bit more. But with that said, you should be working on everything, the whole body all the time. Because again, any weak link in the kinetic chain is going to cause compensation, is going to cause an issue. But if we look at most people, where most people are going to want to work, again, hip flexors are usually tight and weak. We've got the hamstrings tight and weak. So we want to do one for that, one for that. I'm going to go through kind of the, the joints that we're going to work on first. Midsection core slash spine mobility. Uh, upper back, lower back, the whole thing, usually an issue for folks as well. So we want to we want to target one there. The shoulders, uh, particularly the front of the shoulders. So pec major, pec minor, um, somewhere in there. We want to we want to have one for that. And then from there, it's kind of like, okay, do we want to add in some neck? Do we want to add in some ankle? Ankle is usually a good um, a good kind of starting place there because most people aren't thinking about their ankle for you know mobility, stretching, et cetera, unless they're kind of just doing like a stat, uh, generic static stretch. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk through the listeners right now. Um, obviously you've got to, you got to hone in and really, really, uh, you know, focus here, but so for the hamstrings, right. Most people are either sitting on the ground again, bending down to touch their toes, static stretch, or another version is placing your heel, um, on like a box or a bench or a couch, and then kicking your hips back until you feel that stretch, um, in your hamstring, right? That's a pretty common stretch. Again, that would be a static stretch. So we want to turn this turn this into an active stretch. So what we would do is once we're once that hamstring is maximally stretched out, we want to drive our heel down into the couch or the the chair or whatever our, our heel is on, and that's going to force that hamstring to contract while it's maximally stretched out. And we'll hold that again anywhere from ten to twenty seconds. We'll ramp up the intensity as we do numerous sets, and so. That's going to be the first one, an active, that's kind of like the most basic version of the active hamstring stretch, but it's, it's amazing. I mean, just that stretch alone, um, you know, I've had people do a, and the listeners, why don't you try this literally right now, pause it. And if you can, you know, do what I just said here, as far as put your heel on that, on that, uh, that box, kick the hips back, stretch it out, contract that hamstring, hold for 20 seconds. And maybe the first rep is about a 50% contraction. Take a little break in between five, 10 seconds, second rep, third rep, fourth rep. But I want you to do a pre and post test. Before you do it, stand up straight, put your feet together, uh, keep your knees straight, 
bend down, see if you can touch your toes. Now, a lot of people aren't going to be able to. Some people you might, um, everyone should be able to touch their toes, no matter how long their legs are, how long their arms are, et cetera. That's just like a, a baseline human movement that everyone should be able to do. But I've seen people, even just one session, you know, say that five minutes of that stretching, they'll get from four inches above their toes to touching their toes like that. And people are like, man, is that magic? No, it's not magic. It's actually just using effective techniques. Um, so that's hamstrings. Hip flexors, um, that classic kind of half kneeling hip flexor stretch where the back knees down, your front leg is bent and you're kind of, you know, kneeling on the ground per se in kind of like a lunge position. You would then translate your hips forward where you feel that stretch in the hip flexor. That's kind of like the basic, you know, kind of generic hip flexor static stretch. Good position to start off with, but let's turn that into an active stretch. So then what we're going to do is we're going to contract our hip flexor muscles while they're maximally stretched out. And so to do that, I like people to think of dragging your knee forward on the mat, but it's not going to go anywhere because it's obviously down on the ground and you've got gravity on top of it. But now what you're doing is you're contracting that muscle while it's stretched out. So the key there is to keep that stretch and contract that hip flexor forward. Um, and again, we're going to hold from 10 to 20 seconds, different intensities. Um, now moving on to the spine, um, a lot of, a lot of listeners might be familiar with the the cat cow or cat camel, um, which is a pretty good uh, muscle activation and stretch on its own, as long as you're really contracting, say, the, the abdominal muscles when you're flexed and the spinal erectors when you're um, extended. But we like to improve that. And so we do segmented cat camels. So instead of just globally flexing and extending your back, you're going to focus on moving one individual one individual vertebrae at a time. That's a, that's a tricky one there. Uh, and so you're going to start at your low back all the way up to your neck. And you're going to think about making a wave of motion, again, from your, your hips up to your low back, up to your middle back, up to your neck until your entire spine is slowly extended. And you're, you're putting your brain in those muscles that are attached into the spine. And then you're reversing that curvature by bringing your chin to your chest and then flexing one vertebrae at a time. Now, this is something that you know takes a lot of it takes repetition because again, a lot of people just, they, they lost suboptimal activation of these muscles. And, um, it's challenging for people in the beginning, but after a while you put the reps in, your spine is going to be, you know, bulletproof and ready for whatever. So that's, that's the spine shoulder. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the pecs, pec major, pec minor, just, you know, I'm just going through kind of like the more generic positions that people are familiar with. I mean, we can get super technical um, with, I mean, we've got thousands of different positions and active stretches that we use in the app, but you know, it would take me a few minutes versus just demoing them. So the pec, you know, everyone's seen that kind of uh, doorway pec stretch, right? Um, where you're just basically putting your arm up, you're stretching out that pec, the front of the shoulder, maybe the, the front deltoid a little bit. And then they're just kind of relaxing. Um, again, static stretch. Let's turn that into an active stretch. So what we're going to do is we're going to, once we're maximally stretched out, we're going to contract the front of the shoulder while it's maximally stretched out the front of the chest. And we're, again, we're going to hold that for 10 to 20 seconds, varying intensities. Um, so that's number four. And then number five for the ankles, um, we can just turn a, a position that a lot of people are familiar with when they stretch out their calf muscles. Um, you know, when you're kind of putting your hands up on a wall or something and you've got your back leg behind you, your, your leg is, your knee is straight. And then you feel that stretch on the back of your lower leg. Again, that's a static stretch. Uh, we can easily turn that into an active stretch by contracting those calf muscles, your gastrocnemius and your soleus muscle while they're maximally stretched out. And a good cue for that is picture yourself or imagine yourself pushing your foot on a gas pedal, and then you're going to contract those muscles, turn that into an active stretch. And that's, again, we would hold that for, you know, 10 to 20 seconds, three to four reps, kind of depending on what our goal is. And we can also add in all kinds of variations to that. Like we originally talked about in the front of the segment here episode, we talked about contracting the pec in a shortened position. And we can do that for all these stretches. So for the ankles in that situation, after I contracted my calves for 10 to 20 seconds, then I would, I would relax and then I would stay in the stretch and I would contract the muscles on the front of my ankle, which in this case are your tibialis anterior. Um, and then I would hold that contraction for 10 to 20 seconds. Um, so now you're getting both sides of the joint. And so that's a really solid, like five stretches that, um, 
you know, people are most likely familiar with that we can kind of turn those into active stretches and make them more effective. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible, man. I really, really appreciate that, that walk through the explanation, the breakdown. I mean, for the audience that doesn't, you know, anybody that doesn't have a, a, a background in mechanics and, and muscle connections and, and stuff like that, got a really good, clear visual with the way that you kind of, kind of broke those things down. And I think for anybody that wants to maybe take it a layer or two deeper, uh, tell them where they can find you, tell them where they can get plugged into to the movement vault app. Is it something that's available, uh, on both iOS and Android? Yeah. So, so kind of walk through where, where people can find that and, and, and what you got going on over there with the movement vault. Yeah. So the movement vault app is essentially, it's a better way to stretch. Obviously you guys have heard me talking about, uh, active stretching at this point. It's a better way to stretch, prevent and fix pain and injury. And so we've got a new daily active stretching class every day. I kind of mentioned that anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes long, um, you know, short and effective, get in, get on with your day. And we hit different areas of the body throughout, you know, each day. So today might be a shoulder and back day. The next, you know, tomorrow might be a, a hip and ankle day. We have full body flow days. And again, we're using, primarily active stretching um, and muscle activation techniques with some routines, throwing in some uh, muscle and fascia release stuff, no static stretching, obviously at this point. And then we've got other routine types too, uh, such as pre-workout where we'll use some banded stuff, some, you know, maybe some dumbbells, some like kettlebell things. You know, we try to make everything pretty, at least for our daily classes, minimal equipment. So we want to make sure people can do them anytime, anywhere, but for the pre-workout, um, you know, we, we have stuff with no equipment, with some bands, uh, we've got recovery routines, which are a little bit more gentle, um, not quite, you know, static stretching, but just minimal activation, working on breath work. Uh, we've got uh, work routines, which are small little nuggets that you can actually perform at your desk if you are sitting. And then we have complete pain and injury programs, such as our 16-week low back pain program, 12-week uh, neck pain program, plantar fasciitis program, uh, et cetera. So that's all included in the app. And you can find that you can find out more information at movementvault.com again that's movement v a u l t.com and the question for um you know is it on android uh, ios so we have a uh, apple iphone app right now for apple users obviously uh we're, we'll, we will be launching our android app relatively soon but for the android users and those that want to use the app on their laptop or desktop or something bigger we we totally redesigned and launched our uh, our new web app at the same time when we launched our iPhone app. So all the same functionality um, of the iPhone app in the web app, and you would just go to the the website to sign up for that. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And, you know, it's to get the messages, you know, from people all over the world. We have users in 40 different countries, um, you know, that were, were literally, you know, helping solve this back pain that people have been dealing with for so long that they just wrote off, you know, they're just living with this three or four out of 10 back pain or knee pain or you name it. Um, and then they've tried this, 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 this thing. And then to finally find movement fault and find that we actually literally help them fix this. And now they, they're on board with, you know, movement fault prevention, um, these messages and DMs and all the things that we get, uh, it just, it really feels as corny as it sounds. This is why I became a physical therapist, why I'm creating, why I created movement vault and, we'll, and why we'll continue to progress is we literally want to help you. You know, we want to help you know, regardless of your goals, um, our program isn't a one size fit all for everyone. We have a lane in within movement vault for you. And that's why we have so much content packed in there. Um, and so, yeah, you can, Check us out at movementvault.com or any of the social platforms. We put out uh, put out some info on there as well. We're at Movement Vault. You know all the all the uh, standard Instagram, TikTok. Um, trying to make a little bit more of a presence on Twitter here on my more personal side. Dr. Grayson Wickham. Um, actually, it's Dr. Grayson DPT. I think at uh, Twitter. But uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, kind of us. Yeah, no, that's incredible, man. I mean, the work that you're doing uh, is so important. It's so needed. Uh, just shattering these these limiting beliefs that people have had around some of these things, educating from such you know an experienced high level background. Uh, so so grateful for you and so grateful for your knowledge and wisdom and expertise here today. I felt like in you know the, the, the little bit over an hour that we had, I mean we, we jam packed so much into today's conversation. So guys, we'll have all of those links, the movement vault, all the socials. Uh, like I said, we'll have that episode plugged down there if you guys want to go a little bit uh, deeper into the shoe stuff. But make sure to connect with Grayson. Um, make sure to try this out because I think everybody can can benefit. I mean, even some of the things you're saying uh, that that's in there, I'm like, I I, I, I need that. So uh, really, really awesome, man. Really grateful for you and everything that you're doing. Um, so we like to end it here with the same question on every single episode. Dr. Grayson, obviously the title of our show is called The Superman Life. We were kind of talk, talking about that before we jumped in. 
Um, you know, and for me, so we're going to go in a little bit di different direction than the entire conversation here with this last question. But, uh, you know, for me, when I talk about living a superman life, it's, it's, it's really a, a way that I try to show up in the world every single day, or it's a belief system that I hold pretty deeply uh, to, to who I am. And it's coming from the place first that I do believe that we're put here for a purpose. Uh, and I think you are a clear example of somebody that is literally walking that out in their life right now uh, with your background, with your expertise, um, having worked with pro athletes, having worked hands on with thousands of people. Now you're able to take all that and really share it through a mobile platform with people all across the globe. I think that's probably a part of, of why you're here on this earth right now. But I don't think it just stops there. We can't just accept that God's put us here for, for something. We must be very intentional about developing that. And that's obviously shows in, in what you've done with your uh, your education, your hands-on experience. So I see you as living out uh, my belief of what living a superhuman life is. But as we end today's conversation, Dr. Grayson Wickham, how would you define living a superhuman life? Yeah, I mean, for me, it is. It is. That's really the driving force. Like you, you kind of wrapped it up. I really appreciate all all the things that you said. Um, you know, as I kind of navigated again, I turned forty this year. Um, you know, in my early twenties, trying to figure things out. Like, hey, what am I? What do I want to do? What am I? What am I here for? You know, and you know, as as things start to come out, you make certain decisions and you get more engulfed and more deep into a certain thing. I've always been into you know health and fitness and lifestyle and all these things, but really started going down this path, um, you know, well over a decade ago. Um, it was it was pretty evident to me that this was really why I, why I was here and this is my mission. Um, so that is really the driving force and. It really what drives me literally every day is just to try to, how can I help people? I mean, the amount of money that's spent on low back pain alone in the United States is staggering, hundreds of millions of dollars. And all this stuff is preventable, uh, knee pain, uh, whether I am trying to help someone prevent or fix pain and or if I'm trying to help someone perform better, they're actually done via the same things, you know? So that's that's really my driving force as far as what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I try to, you know, practice what I preach, um, whether it comes to the movement side, the fitness side. Um, I'm, a, I'm really into just trying to, yeah, I wouldn't say like, I'm, I'm not spending hours a day just trying to parse out every little thing, but I'm trying to do the, the big global things that are going to make the most difference in my life. Um, so that, that really is my driving force. Um, but, you know, just making making people happy, allowing them to do what they want to do in their lives is, um, is really, I guess, I don't know if I call it a, a super, super human trait or power, but, uh, you know, it's, it's what I'm continuing to try to get better at every day. And I will, I would just strive. Um, and I would say, yeah, if, thinking about it, just rambling here at the end, um, my thirst for knowledge, you know, and my thirst to continue to progress as a person, um, failing along the way, uh, learning along the way, um, you know, just doing everything like a lot of people do and reassessing what's working, what's not working, um, seeking out new knowledge, changing my opinions, all those things in that process of just trying to you be the best human I can be. Um, living by the golden rule is, is kind of, I guess, one of my, one of my uh, powers, if I would be so uh, <laughs> chest pounding and call it that. It's incredible, brother. Uh, we are all better because of you here today, man. And uh, I want the guys to get plugged into the app, uh, follow Grayson on all the socials. Um, to do is putting content out like nobody else. And it's not just this wish-washy stuff that's regurgitating because he saw a YouTube video that broke some things down. He's in the trenches. He's reading the research. He's hands-on experience, decade plus, high level, low level, intermediate, all across the board. So Dr. Grayson, so incredibly thankful for you and what you've shared here with us today. Guys, we hope you got value out of this conversation. If you did, uh, you can support us in two ways. First off, go follow Grayson. I said that multiple times here already. So make sure you do do that. Um, but support us, right? You guys, you know, we we deliver these episodes here every single week to you. Um, stop being a consumer and begin to become a contributor to what we're doing here. And we ask two things out of you here today. First off, if you haven't done so yet, after this episode, make sure to leave us a five-star rating and written review on whatever platform you are consuming this. But most importantly, if someone in your life needs to hear this, maybe you know that guy that's always sitting next to you in the cubicle and he's complaining about his back and knees. Be like, dude, I got something for you. Shut up and just listen to this thing and stop, stop stretching, start doing some mobility. So do us the favor, but anybody out there, the blessing by sharing today's conversation with them. But for Grayson Wickham, your host, Frank Rich, we love you guys. We'll see you next week.